Amen. Amen. Would you take your Bibles and open them to Daniel chapter 2? You'll recall in our study through Daniel, we're studying using the New Living Translation. So if you don't have an NLT, there should be one in the chair behind you that you can follow along with us. Uh, We're looking at Daniel chapter 2, verse by verse, in the Bible study that I had entitled, A Divine Setup by God. Because God is working behind the scenes in your life right now to set you up for what's up ahead. That he's always looking forward to what's up ahead in your life. While you might be worried and concerned about the future, God has your future firmly in control. He is on the throne, arranging circumstances. Even some of the most difficult circumstances are all used by God to accomplish his will and his purposes. And could it be the frustration you're feeling right now and could it be the difficulties you're experiencing right now are simply because you're not trusting God with your future and just knowing that he's got it under control. And perhaps you're trying to take some control back yourself. The, the life of Daniel and his friends revealed to us God's sovereign hand upon those things that relate to our lives. And now God is going to get the attention of this unbelieving, rage-filled king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Secular history sheds light on how brutal, despotic, and raging this king really was. That literally it's recorded that people would tremble in his presence. And yet, the king trembled before no one except when these dreams came. And now these dreams have shaken him. You know, think of for a moment how few people have access to him. How very few people can get anywhere close to him. And how you may be praying for someone right now that you have no access to and probably can never see yourself have access to, and yet God has access to them. And he gets his attention by this troubling dream. Let's pick up in verse 1 for context in chapter 2. It says, one night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I have had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, long live the king, tell us the dream, and we'll tell you what it means. But the king said to the astrologers, I'm serious about this. If you don't tell me what my dream was and what it means, you'll be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be turned into heaps of rubble, verse 6. But if you tell me what I dreamed and what the dream means, I'll give you many wonderful gifts and honors. Just tell me the dream and what it means. And they said again, please, your majesty, tell us the dream and we'll tell you what it means. And the king replied, I know what you're doing. You're stalling for time because you know I'm serious when I say if you don't tell me the dream, you're doomed. So you have conspired to tell me lies, hoping I will change my mind. But tell me the dream and then I'll know that you can tell me what it means. So the king can't sleep. He's troubled. He's troubled by these dreams. There's a little bit of debate on whether it was many dreams or he received the same dream multiple times. Nevertheless, God has his attention. So he calls for the wise men, these wise guys. They're known here as magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers. And he demands that they tell him the dream and the interpretation. And yet they're not going to give them any interpretation because they don't know the dream. Even today, as many people spend money on all of this nonsense, astrology and, and palm reading and, and some of the television shows that are there, it's, it's all nonsense. They're, they're using manipulation techniques to draw you into a place of trust. And, and they're experts at body language. As they watch your body language and they take you in certain places and then begin to speak to you and they go, oh yeah, oh yeah, and you, they lead you on. These guys don't know. And I believe the king understood that. And that's why he's telling me, I'm not telling you anything. You tell me the whole package. And I don't believe he believed in these guys. I know that he was challenged in his life to the core. But now that it matters, before he could use these astrologers and enchanters and magicians as as, as part of his controlling the kingdom, but now when it comes to his life, 
Now when it comes to his life, he's calling them out for the reality that they really don't know what they're talking about. Haven't you found that to be true? Haven't you found that to be true in people's lives where they're so confident in things when it doesn't apply to them? And yet when it comes down to their life, then there's a real test. And the truth comes out. You know, the lies of this world. It's just the world seems to be one big lie. And the lie is that there is no God. Everything kind of funnels from there is no God. But the lies of the world, that the world really doesn't have the answer to your problems. The world really doesn't have the type of help you're looking for. The world really doesn't have sufficiency and strength. doesn't provide hope. And yet, the Father provides that to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jot this down. Let me just share a few things to encourage you in the Word today as God becomes our all in all. And God's going to allow you to experience certain things in your life that shed all the little things that you've been depending upon so that God becomes your all in all. And according to Psalm 38, verse 22, the psalmist cries out, Come quickly to help me, O Lord, my Savior. In Psalm 40, verse 7, As for me, since I'm poor and needy, let the Lord keep me in his thoughts. You are my helper and my Savior. O my God, do not delay. How about 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5? It is not that we think we're qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. Or in the New King James, it says, our sufficiency is from God. Sufficiency, you are all sufficient by faith in him. Psalm 19, verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 71, verse 5. O Lord, you alone are my hope. I've trusted you, O Lord, from my childhood. The king is in a place where not even those that he's trusted before can help him. Verse 11. Well, really, verse 10. The astrologers replied to the king, no one on earth can tell the king his dream. And no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. Verse 11. The king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods, notice little g, can tell you your dream. And they do not live here among people. And the king was furious when he heard this. And he ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be executed. And because of the king's decree, men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. The book of Daniel, remember, is not so much about Daniel. Although he gets all of the attention, he is a prophet of God. And so the book of Daniel is going to be about prophecy. He also is a man that's dedicated. Remember, he's that man that said, that young man that says, I will not defile myself with the king's delicacies. So he's a man of purpose. He's a man of decision. And so the book of Daniel is not only going to be a prophetic book, but it's also going to be a book of purity. But the problem we often make with books of the Bible or pages of the Bible or sto true stories in the Bible is that we make those about the person. Listen, the Bible is not about you and it's not about Daniel and it's not about me. Don't forget this. Whenever you open the Bible, the Bible is about God. Anyone want to amen to that? Amen. That'll help you read the Bible. The Bible's not about you as much as it ministers to you. The Bible is not about a self-help type of book to help you in your times of trouble, although when you get to know God by faith, you find that he's your hope, he's your strength, he's your sufficiency, he's your salvation. But the Bible is not about helping you in your tr troubles. The Bible is not about helping you become a better person. The Bible is not even about your salvation as much as it's about God and his love for you. All of those other things are secondary. I mean, what other book in this world do you open up and you come face to face with the reality of God's love for you and his care and concern for your life and how he's gone, listen, from our perspective, from, this is purely human perspective, but how from a human perspective, God has gone out of his way to draw you into a relationship with him, to redeem and to buy back that relationship that was lost through your sin and mine. So when we open up and we begin to read about Daniel, the Bible's not about Daniel. The book of Daniel is not even about Daniel as much as it is about God. God is on center stage. And God is in charge. 
God is orchestrating the events of our lives to grow us into a deeper relationship with him. Now, we agree to that. There isn't anyone among us that wouldn't say amen to the good things in our life. Yeah, I just got a raise. Fantastic. Yay, praise God. Things are going. I just celebrated so many months or so many years of marriage. Oh, yeah, praise God. I was able to get a new car. Praise God. Whatever it might be that you're praising God for. Yes, God is sovereign. He's working all things together for the good. Got me new tires on the car, gas in the tank. It's awesome. It's great. But it's harder to accept that when you face the difficulties in life. And there isn't anyone that doesn't face difficulties or disappointments or that's not how I thought it would turn out or that's not the way I wanted it to turn out. Then a great test on our belief in God's sovereignty comes to light. And we're actually trapped by the words of our own mouths. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We have to remember that not only is the Bible about God, but so is your life. It's a reflection of Jesus Christ. These pagan priests and wise men, they admit it. There isn't anybody that can do what you're asking, king. There's nobody. It's impossible. Maybe the gods could do it. Maybe our false gods could do it, but they don't live here. We don't quite know where they live. They changed their address and didn't tell us. We don't know where they are. They don't even offer up an answer. They don't even try to guess. They don't even do any incantations and do any weird dances or they don't do it and puff, you know, and do some kind. They don't try anything. They admit that their gods let them down. Anytime you and I choose to serve a false god, your god will let you down. Your god will always, little god will always let you down. It's only the true one and true god that will come through. And he comes through for the good and the bad. And you look for Daniel, you kind of follow so far in chapter, by the time we come to chapter two, and you know, he, he has been treated wrongly in every way so far. He's been kidnapped, uh, now he's gonna be brainwashed, they're trying to force food and break his religious traditions, uh, he's been separated from his family, we don't even have the story, he only has his friends, but they're not quite together all the time, and now by the time we come to 13, he's gonna be murdered, for what? What has he done? It, it's almost like we come to the life of Joseph and we think, like, what's happened? What has he done? Well, he hasn't done anything. As a matter of fact, Daniel at this point is a man of obedience. As far as we, we know, he hasn't done anything wrong. He hasn't done anything worthy. Sometimes we associate our actions with the life circumstances and if something bad happens, then we almost immediately, well, I must have done something bad. Well, here's an example. And and let me say, there are times where consequences come when we do something bad, for sure. But here's an example of someone up to this point has done everything good and now is being faced with the loss of his life under this rage-filled king that people tremble in front of that have these dreams that nobody knows what they mean. These dreams that come to King Nebuchadnezzar were given for a divine setup. God is setting things up for Daniel who ultimately is setting things up for the coming of Messiah. Ultimately setting things up so that Daniel will write a book that will be the most important key in biblical prophecy when we get to chapter nine. I mean, you tell Daniel, don't worry, bro. I know there's a death threat on you, but God's gonna work it out. You're gonna be famous, man. People are gonna be talking about you thousands of years from now. It's all gonna work out. Don't worry about it. Daniel's not gonna believe you in the moment. But I'm here to declare to you, whatever you're facing right now, it's a divine setup. God is working in your life. He is protecting you from something, opening a door for you, moving you in another direction, causing you to be broken, to be humble, to draw near to him. It's actually not even anything about what you do, but what God is doing in your life. All that you respond, the only faithful response for us is to submit and surrender to him as we abide in him and allow him to work these things out in our lives. It's a setup for Daniel, but it's actually a setup for God to perform an amazing miracle in the interpretation of this dream. And so many times in our lives, what we view as bad, hard, difficult, even frustrating, are actually God's divine appointments. He's arranging everything for his glory and our good. Have you ever just had God set things up for you? Were you just shocked? It's not the way you thought it would be. Especially some of you that would be more considered more on the pessimistic side of life. Now, maybe you think you're a realist, but everybody thinks you're a pessimist. Either way, 
You're not the person that sees the cup always full, and this is great, it's wonderful. I don't have one flat tire, I have four flat tires, but God, what are you gonna do? If you're not that person, then this is for you. You ready? God is taking even four flat tires, and he's gonna use it for his glory. We don't know what he's doing behind the scenes, but God is setting things up, putting you in the right place at the right time. Maybe you don't have all the answers, but you're dependent upon him. And you just look at it and say, man, Lord, I can look back on things in my life where I really, really, really did not see the good in it in the time it was going on. I just, and you couldn't have explained it to me. You couldn't have sat me down and said, look, Ed, I've got a little insight for God, and this is what it's gonna look like in three or four years. I, I wouldn't have been able to get out of my three or four minutes to look three and four years into the future. But I now have lived a few years. I've lived 20 plus years following Jesus Christ. And as I look back now, I can see a lot of circumstances turned around for God. I can see a lot of things now, God putting the pieces together, arranging things so that he would be glorified through my life. How he was setting things up divinely that I would have never been able to do. And so often in your testimonies and the emails you send, the things that I get to hear what God's doing in your life, it's happening in your life as well. This, this, in verse 13, the king's decree, men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends, is actually a setup to get Daniel before the king. Notice verse 14 now. When Ariok, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them, Daniel handled the situation with, mark these words, wisdom and discretion. He didn't freak out. He didn't flip out. He didn't try to run away. He handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. He asked Ariok, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? So Ariok told him all that had happened. And Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. So Daniel now sees his life facing some murder threat, some murderous threat, a harsh threat from the king, and he, st- he puts his life on the line to step out in faith. And he tells the, he starts to dialogue with Ariok, and he asks him, hey, what's going on? And he asked for more time. He, he went at once, it says, to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. The troubling dream is going to lead to a true revelation And God is going to reveal what this dream is all about. As the order of death is flowing through the kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't joking around. He was serious. And he had the power and authority. But behind the scenes, can I just just encourage you? Can I just convince you today? And can I remind you today, church, here in the sanctuary downstairs, you might be watching online or listening live on the radio right now. Can I please just convince you that God is always at work behind the scenes? He is always at work. I don't know that there can be a more hopeless situation than being brought to the king to lose your life. And yet in a spiritual sense, what did Jesus say? If you seek to gain your life, you'll lose it. But if you seek to lose your life, you'll gain it. Such a spiritual significance. I don't know that most of us will ever experience something like this. Most of us won't experience a situation like this. So what do we experience but this daily, continual call to die to ourselves? The choice between self-sacrifice and personal comfort and ease. Behind the scenes, we see the king's decree as an attempt by Satan to take Daniel out of the kingdom, out of this world. Because while behind the scenes God is at work, behind the scenes the devil is at work. I don't want to give too much credit to the devil. I think that's a big mistake that the church makes today but I don't want to, this pendulum to swing all the way over there and just not acknowledge that the devil's fast at work, whether it be the de- de- devil or the demonic realm. You know, the Bible says, think about some of the issues that you have with another person today. Another person. You have an interpersonal. Most of the frustration in our life is rooted in another person. Is that not true? A lot of the issues in our life is interpersonal. It is our relationships, broken relationships, sin that gets in, and just weird stuff. But the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
And so much energy is wasted as we argue and fight with one another. We're, we're just disobeying the Bible. It's not about the other person. But behind the scenes, so often, the situation's being used by the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy, to separate and to divide, especially within a church, you know, in a family. Families can't, can't stand divided. Churches can't stand divided. Countries can't stand divided. So we happen to be living in the generation is what? The most divided that really has been in recent history. Because it's behind the scenes. God is at work, but so is the devil. And as the time for Daniel's death is near, he meets this guy, Arioch, this captain. Literally, he's the chief executioner. And with Daniel facing death, what does he do? I want to give you three things that you can't miss when you're facing great crisis, when you think all is lost, when, when you are at the end, <clears throat> when you're ready to flip out or you're flipping out right now. Notice what Daniel does. Number one, he remains calm. He remains calm. The situation's out of his control, but that doesn't lead him to be out of control. The situation's out of his control, but that doesn't lead him to being out of control. In the presence of God, he doesn't get flustered. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 19, it says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the wicked. Don't fret because of evildoers. He answers the captain, notice in verse 14, he answers the captain as he handles with wisdom and discretion. <clears throat> wisdom and clarity. Wisdom and carefulness. Like I, I like to say, in handling difficult situations, we need two things that are very helpful. We need to, number one, be prayerful, and number two, we need to be careful. Because the situation can be, our, our response can make things worse, or they can make things better. But I mean, you don't have any control over the situation, so why lose control of your own faculties and your own relationship with the Lord? And why lose control of your faith in God who has everything under his power? Today we would say he doesn't freak out. He doesn't flip out. Which I think, I mean, when you, when you, you know, it's easier to teach a Bible study than to live through things like this. So I acknowledge that. I mean, it would be easy to go, oh man, I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. All right, just do it now. Do it now. I don't even want to look. I'm going to close my eyes. Go ahead. I'm not even going to look at you. Just take, just do it. Just, just take me out. But he doesn't do that. He assesses the situation and he remains calm. Where does calmness come from? But for the believer, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit, where God is flowing through you in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. And the one that's often forgotten, a fruit of the Spirit is self-control, where you're able to walk in calmness. He's confidently steadfast with an answer. And there's something to be said about confidence and calmness in tight and tough situations. And I personally appreciate you men and women that have a sense of calmness and steadiness about you in the times of crisis, where you're just able to face it, and you face it not with such strength and tenacity, and you become an example to us. And you go, oh no, it's nothing, you know, it's just, no, it's, no, it's something, it's something to be admired, and it's something to be encouraged, where you're not the type to flip out, you know what I've found just by observation is that control freaks flip out when they're not in control. Now, there's not a control freak in here that's going to amen that because then they're going <laughs> to... But for those of you that have a tendency to be control freaks or, or maybe you don't call yourself a control freak, you, you say, oh no, I'm, I'm just a perfectionist. I'm just a perfectionist. Well, you know, perfectionism has an element of pride to it. And it has a good element of pride where you take pride in your work, you want to do a good job. That's fantastic. May God increase that in your life. But there's also a sense of pride that's not from the Lord where you're just never satisfied. And you always want to control things. Why? Because it gives you a sense of satisfaction. It gives you a sense of peace. So that, just something to pray. Maybe this is like a word from the Lord. It's not actually in my notes. But, you know, I think it's just something for you to pray about that perfectionism and control has become an idol in your life and it needs to be crucified before God. 
it's actually hindering your worship of God and making you less effective for the kingdom. Isn't it amazing how the devil in your own flesh will turn things around? That God can actually use your attention to detail, your love for doing things right for the kingdom. He loves that. But it can actually be turned against you and become an idol, idolatrous, prideful thing in your life. Daniel stays calm. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, verse 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. My pastor Jeff used to share this, and I jotted it down. He said, uh, he would share this. He said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and hurry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. And just trusting in the care of the Lord. You know, every year, the birds come back to my house. <laughs> every year. I don't care what I do. I bleach everything. I put a sign, you're not welcome. No solicitation. I talk to the birds at the curb. You're not welcome here. Get out. I throw football on my roof. I don't hit the birds, just in case it's not against the law to throw football on my roof but I throw a football on the roof to scare them away. And they just look at me like, this is my house. <laughs> and they harass me. And they, they come back every year. I don't know why they've chosen my house in my neighborhood, but I can tell you this. Those birds, they come back fatter every year. <laughs> Somewhere they're getting their food. Somewhere they're being taken care of. Some, somewhere, somewhere birds, you know, and, and birds, they just kind of take up residence. They make all their nests. They got all their food and they don't pay the rent on my house. They're not writing a check, but they own the place and they're, they'll find, they'll burrow into place. I didn't even know where they, they were there and I'll be walking out to take out the trash and I know the birds showed up because the sidewalk where my trash is, is filled with the bird stuff. And I'm like, what are they doing? They don't even clean up their mess. Because Jesus would remind us, because you know the birds come back to your house too, and your neighborhood and your trees around the springtime. It's actually kind of cool, because when you start to hear the birds singing, you know winter is gone. Because they're smart enough not to be around during the winter. I don't know where they go in the winter, but they're smart enough to take off. And, and I remind, Jesus would just take the north. This is how practical Jesus is. Simple. He would just look at the birds. You go, see the birds? I mean, you could come out and see the birds, the ones that are all, see them? They have a Father in heaven that takes care of them. And aren't you much more valuable? Listen, aren't you much more valuable than birds? Aren't you so much more valuable than the birds of the air? How much more will your Father in heaven take care of you? Take care of all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Make sure that you're fed. Make sure that, yeah, yeah, maybe it's not what you want. Maybe you're not eating the food that you want or you're not living with the roof over your head that you wanted. Maybe you're not driving the car you dreamed of. Maybe, maybe the numbers in your bank account don't measure up to what you thought they were. But the Lord's still faithful. He takes care of you. Maybe you've gotten caught up in the American dream and you've forgotten about the, sur the surrendered life of the believer in Jesus Christ that the American dream is just an illusion. That in your dreams, you want to be dreaming about the Lord and the goodness of God in your life. Remembering that He's on the throne. He remains calm. Number two, He exercises His faith. Daniel does in verse 16. He went at once to see the king, but here's His faith. He requested more time. He's got a death sentence on His head. He's been found by Arioch, and some people, some of the translations would say Arioch is the chief executioner, not just the captain, but the chief executioner. And what does he do? He steps out in faith. But how did he get such faith in the midst of death, in the midst of a, of a death sentence? Well, it started way back when they put food on the table. It started back when, remember, come back in the beginning, turn back to the beginning in chapter one, where we find that as they're taking to, as they're taking, taken captive and all the food was set before them. Remember verse eight? In verse eight in chapter one, Daniel was determined 
not defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. And he asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Or in the New King James, it says what? He purposed in his heart. Faith leads to purpose, and purpose leads to faith. It always starts with faith. And faith grows by obedience. We have it backwards. We think somehow if we obey, then we'll have more faith. No, it starts with faith because the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so it starts with faith. It starts with trusting God. You look at this situation and you go, this isn't good, this isn't, but I trust God with my life. And then it's followed with a test. And that test is met with, no, I'm not gonna eat this food. I'll I'll die, I'll die right here on the spot. I'm not eating. Would you please let me? And then he he arranged that, hey, we'll just be vegetarians. And if, you know, if God's not in it, then we'll just see where it is. But if God's in it, then I won't have to defile myself. And now, how would he know? How would he know about this dream? How would he know that he's going to face death? How would he know? He wouldn't know. And that's why God's training us to be faithful with the little things. That's why the Bible says not to despise the days of small things but to be faithful with what's before us. Some of you are waiting for great, big, grand plans to unfold in your life. You're wondering why God hasn't done this yet and why God hasn't done that. And you you have a missionary. One of the reasons we want you not just to support missionaries, but the reason why we give so much time to missionaries here is because we want you to be one. So you are here and you go missionary, but some of you are not so excited. You're like, oh, I want to be a missionary. Poor me. I'm never going to be a missionary. Why do they get to be missionaries? And it's just a battle you have. I'm not judging you, it's just the reality. Instead of being happy with them, you're kind of looking at your own life and go, woe is me and why don't I have? And and look at and 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 you're wondering, well, why isn't God doing this big great work in my life? Well, because you haven't done what he's told you to do, right? Just in front of you. And you say, Ed, well, what has he told me to do? I don't know, but you know. And you can't sidestep the small things to get to the big things. Because big things really in the kingdom of God are just a series of small things built up, faith upon faith, grace upon grace. Daniel encouraged me. He was calm, but he also exercised faith. He put his faith on the line. He went and asked for time so he could interpret the dream. He's not known as a dream interpreter. That, that's not his title. This is the first time it's even mentioned, but he asked for help. He asked for time. He actually persuades the executioner to give him a little bit more time. Do you think God was behind that? I don't know what it is. There's a soft time in the executioner's heart. Sure, I'll give you a little extra time. What was he thinking here? He didn't have the answer. But really, what did he have to lose? If he failed and God didn't give him the answer, he'd die and he'd be in the presence of God. So what did he have to lose? The fear of man is so, so ugly. It's just something that You know, the fear of man, the show partiality to men. I I recently saw it come up in my life. And, you know, it had gone away for so long after the loss of my son. And and I just stopped caring about those things. You know, I just stopped. My my life was almost like in survival mode. And I just was desperate for God. And now as God's bringing healing in my life and I'm getting a little bit stronger, man, I saw this glimpse of the flesh in my life where I had a real genuine second thought of fearing man. And not just fearing man, like, but, in, but wanting to impress, or what if I say this? Like, like, it's just a weird thing that goes on in our lives. And I'm grateful now that I have perspective in my life where I already had made the decision. I had already made the decision, and then a couple things happen, and in my mind, I'm like, I don't know, maybe I should make a different decision. Anybody, is it, are you guys all just judging me right now? Like, did anybody <laughs> ever have something like that? Or you made a decision, but then you're like, I don't know, maybe, I'm not sure. Like, well, what about this? And how about this happens? It's like, no, God's already spoken. And God was just showing me, Ed, man, there's a lot of flesh in your life. You haven't conquered that. You haven't conquered it. You're going to see it many times in your life. So you just stay close to me. Because whenever you're abiding in Christ, you are living the conquered life. Do you know that? In Christ, you have conquered sin and death. In Christ, you've conquered the fear of man. In Christ, you've conquered this desire to impress. In Christ, you are well-pleasing to God. It's the place to be. And so even it was just a brief moment. What I just described to you, I took more time to describe it than what I felt. It happened that fast. I'm like, no. 
No, this is what God wants me to do. And this is what I'm going to do. And the chips are on the table. This is the word that God wants me to share. It was actually a Bible study to deliver. That's what it was. God gave me a Bible study to deliver. And for a brief second, I, di- I almost decided a different study. Imagine that. No, we want the word of God in our lives. And we want to do and to do exactly what he tells us to do. That's where Daniel is. He inspires me. Like, what has he got to lose? What do I have to lose? Remember, Jesus said, don't fear man that can only kill the body. Don't, don't have that kind of fear. That's the worst that they can do to you. But fear God, who can take the body and soul. Live with a healthy fear of God, and that'll build your faith. And here, this, in this man of great faith, he's not trusting God for a blessing. He's not trusting God for a hundredfold return. He's trusting God with his very life and his very breath and his very being. He's in that level and encourages me. Notice now verse 17. We'll get to the third one. Then Daniel went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah what had happened. And he urged them to ask God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. And that night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And then Daniel praised the God of heaven. And that's how fast God can work. What does he do? He goes back and calls a prayer meeting. And he says, I need help. My life is on the line. Let's ask God to reveal what the dream means. And he prays, which is number three. Simple enough, but prayer is so often neglected I mean, we, even our time of prayer here as we gather together as a church can be so, become so routine, so ritualistic, where some of you don't even pray in 10 minutes anymore. You just endure the 10 minutes so you can get to the Bible study. But God does more in 10 minutes of prayer than he can in 45 minutes of Bible study. We need to press in, church, not, way, not fall back. We need to lean into the things of God. And you have a big burden today. It's not a Bible study that's going to solve it. It's not a worship song that's going to solve it. It is the God of heaven that you meet in prayer. He'll solve your problem. But if you pull back and you're just looking at how you will be self-satisfied, because I love Bible study just like you do, but I need to love God more than Bible study. And I love prayer more, than, more just like you do, but, but I need to love the God of prayer more than I love prayer. That God, he's rearranging and recalibrating our church family to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. And he prays, and he gets his friend praying. That's real fellowship. Real fellowship surrounds him talking about the things of God together. That's true koinonia. Sharing one another's burdens you know, in the buzzwords of the church today, it's all about community and all. Listen, community is connecting with other people. You don't need a ministry to have community. There's no such thing as a ministry of community. You're in Christ. You're sitting next to somebody. You're in community. And you go, well, Ed, I'm on the radio. I'm all by myself in the car. Well, when you get out of the car, go find somebody. You're in community. You're in people or people or community. It doesn't need to be a buzzword. Just talk about the Lord with people. You're instantly in fellowship. And you come together and pray. And God, come through. I'm a dead man. I need to know what's happening. This is an open door. Daniel didn't rush in with presumption. Perhaps God wanted him to die. Perhaps. Perhaps he wanted to deliver him. But he doesn't know. So he prayed. Jot this down as we head out. I got a couple things before we go. And no time. But I'm going to give them to you anyway. Ready? There are many times in our lives that we're faced with a perhaps. For example, Onesimus was the runaway slave in Philemon, and he was going to return to Philemon, and Paul writes to him in the book of Philemon, chapter 15, it seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. He's no longer like a slave to you. He's more than a slave, for he's a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he'll mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Now, Onesimus wouldn't have been able to tell this, but perhaps he ran away in order to get saved and become more valuable to uh, to Onesimus. Philemon would become more valuable. Onesimus would become more valuable to Philemon. Now, we can hang on that word some of the most difficult things we're facing. Perhaps God's working something far greater out in our 
far greater in our lives. Perhaps there's something I need to learn about myself, about others, something I need to glean. Perhaps there's something I, I have that God wants me to give away. Onesimus, he left Rome. He left for Rome as a slave, but he returns as a brother. Philemon, he loses a servant, but he's going to gain an eternal friend. And today, perhaps God is allowing that difficult decision to teach you. Perhaps your marriage is struggling for a while that is actually in God's plan. Perhaps that layoff is being used to build you up. Perhaps your singleness is all a part of the, the plan that God wants to use you and wants you to be. Perhaps it's that open door of faith to trust in Jesus who's promised to never leave or forsake you. But when you're backed into a corner, when circumstances have you in a tight place, Daniel, he's calm, he, re, he exercises his faith and he prays. Consider that. And notice as we close in verse 20, he said, praise the name of God forever and ever. For he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and he sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. He reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what lies hidden in darkness, though he's surrounded by light. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors, for you have given me wisdom and strength, and you've told me what we asked of you and revealed to us what the king demanded. You know, verses 20, 21, 22, and 23 would never exist had Daniel not experienced great... He still doesn't even know if he's going to be alive. But he trusts God. Remember, we read the book of Daniel, we know the whole story. Daniel doesn't know the whole story of his life yet. He's just walking moment by moment by faith. And he has the insight and he believes God from the insight. He says, this has got to be from God. And after he reveals the dream, he doesn't take credit for it, but he gives God the glory. Not only does he praise him, but he offers up a song of thanksgiving. Calm and confidence, faith and prayer leads to praise. And you, I guess you can add number four when, if you want to add number four, uh, when, when faced with great difficulty, after you pray, you praise you just rejoice. Too often we have it backwards. Let's try to please the king and do what we can do to make people happy, but we miss it completely. God specializes in miracles and impossibilities. He is the God of miracles. You might be in a jam right now just so you can learn this truth firsthand, so you can see your own flesh, what other people see in your life. But God wants to show you personally. That's your flesh life. It needs to die. You need to crucify that. You can't nurture it. You can't coddle it. You can't, even if people around you help make excuses for you, you will never live that deeper life of faith until you kill the flesh. There's no good thing that dwells in my flesh. The fear of man when I come into the pulpit can never take root in my heart or I will no longer be a man of God. I'll be a man of Ed and that will be a disaster. And I wonder what it is that God's teaching you to be a man or a woman of God and not a man or a woman that fears man more than they fear God because you're faced with an impossibility, because it's out of your control, because it's life-threatening and it's devastating and it's crushing you. Maybe it's not so serious. Just something happened you didn't like, you didn't think it was right and, and now, like, what's God showing you? so that you might grow in his grace, that you might become the man, the woman that God wants you to be. Some of you have never trusted this way before, ever. You're struggling with issues in life and yet you don't know what to do. You have no savior. You have no savior. You've got religion. You've got church attendance. You've got a brand new Bible, but you've got no Jesus. <laughs> you don't know him personally. You've never surrendered your life to him. You never asked him to forgive you of your sins by acknowledging what a sinful person you are, that you sin against a holy and a righteous God. Like God is, God is in the business of saving souls. We've got to look at this. I, wanted you to see, I want you to see it. Turn over to Luke chapter six, and this is where we'll close. I've just been meditating on this, and, and then I see it in, this, in, in the context of this. You know, I prepared this message a couple weeks ago and I was looking at it again today and just refreshing it in my mind and my heart. Go over to Luke chapter 6 because so often we're just in these situations where some of you are still not convinced that
God works the impossible. And all that's waiting for you is for you to believe him. For you to believe him. Notice in verse 6 of chapter 6. It's one of those episodes in the life of Jesus where he meets this guy with a withered hand. And on another Sabbath day, a man with a deformed right hand was in a synagogue while Jesus was teaching. The teachers of religious law and Pharisees watched Jesus closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Listen, you're in church leadership here. You serve somewhere in this church. You're listening. You're a pastor somewhere. You can become like this, where Jesus is in your midst and you're only looking for ways to accuse. Can you imagine? Jesus is in their midst and they're watching him carefully. Why? Because they want to find a mistake in his life so they can accuse him. On a side note, I just know people walk in and out of this church wanting to find wrong things with it so they never have to come back. It doesn't take long to find wrong things in a church. So I'll just let you off the hook. There are a lot of wrong things here, both things that are seen and not seen. And the only time we'll ever be without wrong and without sin is when we're in the presence of the Lord. So welcome to the club. You're part of the wrong. You're, you've got sin in your life too. And, and you're gonna, it doesn't take long. You go, well, I wonder if this is a church for us. I don't know if it's a church for you, but if you find something to accuse us of, you'll find it. And then what will that lead your life? But if you find a place to go, and I think God called me here. I'm gonna plant myself down. I'm gonna go through it with the long haul. Hey man, welcome. That's how we got here. God is doing a great work. And don't just walk around looking how to accuse people pointing out people's faults. You become like a Pharisee. You you don't want to be that. You don't want to be in the midst of Jesus and like, oh, they plan to accuse him. They were already planning it. No, it's verse eight. No, Jesus knew their thoughts. And so he said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. Can we just pause there for a second? Was this possible for this guy to do? Yes or no? Get up and walk over to me. Was it possible? Yes, because his problem's not with his legs. The problem's with his... Hand, let's just be real simple here. It's not, not a trick question. <laughs> so when Jesus tells him to get up and do something, he could do it. Yes? And isn't that most of our lives? God calls us to do stuff we can do. Uh, I think of tithes and offerings. The easiest thing, one of the easiest things a believer can do is to give to the Lord a portion of what he's already given to you. He's, he's not, you're not doing it by, on a credit card. You're not doing it by one day I'll get paid and I'm going to get... No, whatever God has given you, You're to give back a portion of that to the local church for the work of the ministry that you belong to. It's so easy. So easy. And yet, statistics say that less than 2% of any given church actually gives like that. 2%. That's not a lot of people in the church giving. But it's easy. I I think so many things are just so easy. So easy to do. For him... This was where it is. Come and stand in front of, um, of, of everyone. Come over here. And it says, so the man came forward. Was that a miracle? Just, we're talking today. We're almost done. Was that a miracle? It wasn't a miracle. Because a lot of the things that the Lord calls us to do don't require a miracle. <laughs> I just, Jesus knows what he's doing here. And this guy doesn't know yet that his hand's going to be healed. All he was told is get up and come over here. So what did he do? He got up. And it came over. It's how Daniel's living his life. But it doesn't end there. So the man came forward, verse 9. Then Jesus said to his critics. So the guy's standing there, but now he's talking to the critics. I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or destroy it? And he looked around at them one by one and said to them, said to the man, hold out your hand. Okay, let's ask the question. Is this possible for the man to do? In his own strength, is it possible for the man to do? No, he can't. He can't do this. And I wonder how many times in his life, up to this point, he sent the signal from his brain down his arm to his hand and said, move. Move. In the New King James, it says he has a withered hand. I wonder how many times. Maybe, maybe he did it for years and then finally gave up. And then every once in a while, well, maybe today. And he's, no, my hand's still deformed. And it's been like this for a long time. He meets Jesus. He's in the midst of the critics. By the way, the the religious rulers don't care about this guy. That's what happens when you become a judgmental, accusing Pharisee. You don't care about people anymore. So they don't even care about him. And as they're there, as he's there, he says, I want you to hold out your hand. 
And then it, not even a breath as you're reading this. If you were doing this for your devotions, you wouldn't even take a breath. You would say, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. And we learned something here. With this absolute impossibility, this man not only didn't have the capacity to do this on his own, but he'd never been able to do this, ever. He could have answered and said, no, there's no way I can do this. It's impossible. But that's not what he does. That's not what the text says. Without even taking a breath, his hand was restored. And at this, the enemies of Jesus were wild with rage and began to discuss what to do with him. That was their response to a guy being healed. They want to kill Jesus all the more. And here's what we learn. I know it's simple and it's a reminder for many of you. But it's important to realize, especially those of you that are on the verge of faith right now. The commands of God, the divine commands of God come with the divine enablement to obey. The divine commands of God. So, so here's what it looks like. Some of you are saying, well, when I have enough faith, then I will. When I know this, then I will. When I have this, then I will. And then you've lived your whole life like that. That's just been your whole life. Then I will, then I will, then I will. But if it was a divine command of God, then he's also at the same time giving you the divine empowerment to obey him. We want faith first, enough to our comfort level, but God has already given us faith first to obey him at his command. And that's how Daniel comes to a place where he faces death. And he's actually shown in the text as in control. God has given him the ability to be in control of the situation that's outside of his control. Isn't that it's amazing? Like Daniel inspires me. Because you got situations out of your control, but you don't need to lose control. We well, had, what do you mean? Well, hey, the divine commands of God come with his enablement. And the moment he tells you to do something is the moment you have the power to obey him. And so, Father, we're asking you to give us encouragement and inspiration in the life of Daniel. As we gather together on this Wednesday, I know so many churches are going away now, even from midweek services. But, God, we love coming together midweek. We love that encouragement and that boost. We love that ability to gather together. We love all the guest teachers that come through. We love the testimonies and we love the baptism nights and we love our midweek Bible study and we love to study your word together because not just for academic, not just to know the Bible, but to know the author of the Bible. So thank you for the true story of Daniel. Thank you for this um, example of calmness, this example of, of staying strong, um, exercising his faith that he already had that you'd already given him. Thank you, God, for the privilege of, of watching him pray and then praise. And he hasn't even shared the dream yet, but he believes that what you're doing in his life is true. And I just pray for a, a strengthening of faith among us today. I pray, God, that you would just encourage that, that maybe a part of the flesh, like in my life last week, was just showed up. I was so ugly that if I never shared it, Lord, it would just be between you and me. And I wonder how much, how much flesh is in this room that you want to crucify. Not because you judge us, Lord, but because you're cleansing us. We're becoming more like you. And we don't want to live in the fear of man. We don't want to live in the critical spirit. We don't want to live with an accusatory heart. We don't want to live separate and divided and broken relationships, Lord. I just pray for that work of rec reconciliation, restoration where it lacks that both parties would meet together in humility at the foot of the cross. That, Lord, even in some things that we have no control over, we have con control over our relationship with you. And may you be well pleased in our lives.